Well, hello and welcome. <clears throat> uh, I'm Dan Asia, president of the Center for American Culture and Ideas, and it's my pleasure to have you all here. Uh, we also have many of you who are Zooming in. Uh, we're having a technical issue with our picture, but uh, you will be able to hear everything uh, that Professor Wax has to say. Uh, this is the first event in our new The Cultured Mind Forum. Uh, what actually is a forum? I, I looked it up. It's kind of some, some, something that I do sometimes. Well, a forum is people gathering together, uh, usually in the marketplace, to exchange goods as well as exchange ideas. And uh, the notion comes from the Romans, but of course it goes back to the uh, the Hebrew Bible with the Jews uh, in Israel as well, where they gathered under one of the gates that uh, allowed you to come into the city. And that's where people uh, made market decisions, and it's also where the elders would make decisions of a legal sort. So it also implies that everybody talked to each other. Nobody yelled at each other. Or maybe they yelled at each other sometimes too, I don't know. But at least they talked to each other. And uh, they discussed uh, ideas to see what they thought was the most appropriate solution for their ideas. And that is really uh, the heart of what we're doing with the cultured mind. We're presenting a place where uh, uh, we can invite speakers to give a talk and we can hear their ideas and then discuss those ideas with them uh, after they've presented them. So I'm very happy to see uh, all of you here today. And uh, feel free to uh, stay on our mailing list and let people know about uh, what it is that we're doing. So it's my uh, great pleasure to present my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Amy Wax. Uh, we have been uh, colleagues on the board of a very important organization called the National Association of Scholars. So I've known Amy as a thinker and as a friend for, for many years. Uh, Dr. Wax is the Robert Mundheim Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Yale University, an MD from Harvard University, and a law degree from Columbia University. From 1988 to 1994, she served in as assistant to the Solicitor General in the US Department of Justice, where she argued 15 cases before the United States Supreme Court. Wax's published works address a wide range of issues in social welfare, law, and policy, including the relationship of the family, the workplace, and labor markets. She is the author of the book Race, Wrongs, and Remedies, Group Justice in the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming Professor Amy Wax. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, you will have to bear with me. I'm working on about four hours of sleep. I got in at three o'clock yesterday. I was the beneficiary of a flash snowstorm, apparently a rare event, uh, but I made it. Um, so the topic of my remarks tonight is the state of American education, a big topic. Uh, but one that as a law professor at Penn, uh, at least for now, I live with every day. It should come as no surprise to many here that higher ed has been taken over by a philosophy called wokeness. What is that? It is an ideology that divides the world into victim and villain gives special status and privileges to oppressed minorities, including gender nonconforming groups, views Western culture and our own United States as irredeemably racist and evil and the source of all that is wrong in the world, forbids praising European civilization and achievements as racist and exclusionary, and enshrines the pursuit of so-called social justice and equity, diversity, and delu uh, delusion, that's a Freudian slip, inclusion as the highest good above all others. The precepts associated with this ideology have now extended their iron grip beyond higher education into pre-university schools, 
exposing K through 12 students countrywide to a distorted, fallacious, and very one-sided version of our history, values, and traditions. Recent research by sociologists Zach Goldberg and Eric Kaufman, based on a survey of thousands of American 18 to 20 year olds, reveals that 93% have learned about at least one of eight woke social justice concepts in school, including the concept of white privilege, of systemic racism, the dominance of the toxic patriarchy, or that gender is a fluid choice unrelated to biological sex. A strong majority have heard many of these concepts. And unfortunately, what they are hearing less and less is an account of our country and our culture's singular achievements, which have brought so much good and prosperity to the modern world. That is increasingly absent from our students' curriculum. In my view, and not just mine, all of this is a catastrophe for our system of education, our universities and our society as a whole. For the universities in particular, the ideas that are being peddled undermine our system's core purposes. It's telos, as Jonathan Haidt has put it. And what is that? The search for truth, the preservation and appreciation for our accumulated knowledge and past accomplishments, the advancement of our understanding of the world, both social and natural, which of course requires free inquiry and robust debate, the touchstones of a liberal open society. And because the universities seed our society's leadership and influence, wokeness is also destructive of our democracy. Our democracy, which requires tolerance and respect, however grudging, and there's nothing wrong with grudging respect, for a range of positions on politics and policy. I myself am a casualty of this pernicious philosophy of wokeness. The dean of my law school has filed formal charges against me seeking major sanctions, all of which are based solely on the expression of my views and opinions. In the strange alchemy of today's woke babble, he has charged me with behavior contrary to the values and mission of the university without ever defining those values or the mission or citing any source of authority, which in fact, it has none in past history and practice. So what are my observations from my years in academia and my attempt to, prevent my, to defend myself against these charges? What does the woke takeover mean for all of us? Despite strenuous assertions to the contrary, woke ideology has had a number of detrimental consequences. First, it has brought a dramatic decline in intellectual standards to our education system. The universities today are awash in a rising tide of double talk, sloppy thinking, undefined labels and slurs, faddish ideas, half-truths and outright lies. The decline in linguistic integrity, the misuse of language is particularly egregious. Here's one example. A student of mine recently told me about one of my colleagues' statements to the media that the Dobbs abortion decision represented a blow to democracy. This is of course complete nonsense. Dobbs returned the regulation of abortion to the states and the democratic process. Whether you approve of that or not, that is what it did. The student did not dare to point that out. So that absurd statement went unchallenged. The case against me at Penn also provides multiple examples of abuse of language, as well as indifference to logic, evidence, consistency, and fairness. My dean has publicly called me every name in the book, racist, sexist, white supremacist, xenophobe, but he's refused to define those terms or even to cite the rules that I violated. He claims I made false statements about the racial profiles of student performance at my school, but he staunchly refuses to back that up with data, which is in his possession, 
And then he says that the law school doesn't keep records anyway. Well, of course, that's a flat contradiction, but never mind. My dean has forbidden me from teaching first year classes based on assertions to students that they can expect me to be biased against them, minority students. But an outside investigator that he called in last year stated that there was no evidence that I had ever shown bias against any student. And anyway, he pointed out that our classes are blind graded, so I wouldn't be able to be biased in my grading of them, but it doesn't matter. After hiding the report from me for eight months, the dean continues to tell the students that they can expect me to be biased. Think about it. This behavior comes from the dean of a law school, not a vet school, not a cosmetology school, not an engineering school. This man is charged with teaching future lawyers about due process, evidence, facts, honesty, and integrity. And this laxity is not just carelessness or a desire to punish unpopular views. And many of my views are unpopular in the academy. It's much darker. It's more sinister. I think it's very threatening. The goal of this progressive left is to destroy and demolish our legal system, its safeguards, its methods, its practices, a system that has taken centuries to build and even with its flaws is the envy of the world. And what do they have against that system? It's oppressive, it's bigoted, it's a cover for hatred, for racism and white privilege. Let's face it, our first world legal system represents whiteness and whiteness has to go, we have to replace it. But what are we replacing it with? Well, with more of third world legal standards, corruption, unprincipled, arbitrary, unpredictable, and fact-free, tribalism, the politics of grievance, preferment, and power. Is this an improvement? Of course not. As I noted recently at a conference on free expression, the only upside I can see is it might help solve our immigration problem because who would want to come here for more of the injustices that they endure at home. Wokeness in education has also wreaked havoc in other important ways. As I said, it has elevated diversity, equity, inclusion, all conveniently undefined as the highest goods to the detriment of academia's traditional goals, which are the pursuit of truth, knowledge, and diversity of ideas. Now, everyone in higher ed, including the burgeoning number of diversity bureaucrats, pretends, deludes themselves that they are, these are compatible priorities, but I can tell you they are not. The education system has displaced traditional academic disputes and rigorous open-minded methods with a distinctly, and I am gonna use this word because I think it is accurate, feminized set of values. I will call them the values of the nursery and the kindergarten. These elevate the protection of people's feelings, their subjective reactions, their emotional and psychological state, however irrational and dubious, as the paramount goal. Anyone who causes any other person, and especially the special groups of the oppressed, the slightest bit of emotional upset or distress, must be penalized and even ejected. I can confidently declare that protecting people's feelings is completely antithetical to the educational mission. Academic free expression, open inquiry, will sometimes result in the expression of ideas and of facts that do not line up with our wishes and desires, that are upsetting, that are emotionally bruising. This is inevitable. This is the way it is. Thus, everyone feeling good about themselves all the time cannot coexist with the bold pursuit of knowledge and truth. Our education system has also launched a full frontal assault on the meritocracy. 
which is and has been essential to maintaining standards of excellence and promoting the highest accomplishments, both in the university and in society at large. Now, the evidence for this assault is everywhere in the attack on testing and on standards for admission to universities and the professions. I could go on and on about that in the headlong pursuit of double standards through affirmative action, in the destruction and attack on institutions serving the gifted, including in my home city of Philadelphia, our exam school masterman, which has abandoned selective admissions resulting in the plummeting of academic standards at the school. There are many other examples I can give, but I will move on. Finally, Wokeness has degraded academia's central purpose of the pursuit of new knowledge through the distortion of the natural and social sciences. And this is the development that I think is the most alarming in some ways that I want to focus on. It has long been understood that the core of the scientific enterprise, which of course it took centuries for our culture to develop, and it is mainly a product of the West, right? The center of the enterprise is the need to examine and test alternative theories and hypotheses. The truth is not assumed, rather it is pursued through an examination of the full range of evidence and the full range of potential causes for any observed phenomena. Another way of saying this is that scientific theories have to be falsifiable, that is capable of refutation through testing and through empirical proof. Now, wokeness has completely undermined these procedures in multiple fields, fields that call themselves scientific. And to appreciate how this has happened, it is necessary to tell an unpopular truth, which is at the center of wokeness, its beating heart, to use Aaron Sabarium, a journalist phrase, is a racialized view of society, a balkanized view, and especially when it comes to the status of Black America. A core commitment of wokeness and its solemn faith is that racism, structural racism, systemic racism, every other kind of racism, is the only source of all group differences and inequalities in our society. The idea is that if racism were banished, all groups would be the same. Their outcomes would be equal. This is a sacred narrative, but I submit it's a defective narrative. Why? Well, because it effectively shuts out alternative explanations for what we see in society, the inequalities that we observe. More specifically, it rules out the idea that behavior, cultural, personal choices, and other complex factors are important or even the most important impediments to group equality in some cases. And it refuses to accept the possibility that given current realities, we may not be able to achieve the exact same outcomes for all groups, that is equity. Equity is an unrealistic expectation for a society built on liberty, on choice, on individual responsibility. To demonstrate the influence of the insistence on equal outcomes and the way that it demolishes social science, I want to use an excellent essay from a Duke sociologist, John Stadden, that recently appeared in a publication called Academic Questions. This is a publication of the National Association of Scholars, this organization that Dan Asia and I are affiliated with. In this essay, Stadden quotes from a talk by a Black economist, a prominent Black economist at UNC, who in 2006 gave a speech urging his fellow economists to recognize a new field. And he called that field stratification economics. What is stratification economics? I will quote, the objective of stratification economics is to perform bypass surgery on the argument that groups in subordinate positions are ranked there because of their own deficiencies or self-defeating behaviors. 
The idea that group-based inequalities are due to defective cultural habits or practices on the part of subordinated communities poses a conceptual occlusion that requires circumvention. Now that is a lot of fancy academic babble. But what it boils down to, and what is Darity is saying, is that we need a new social science that rules out at the start, ab initio, any inquiry into the possibility that observed racial inequalities can be attributed to behavior, to chanda, conduct, to choices, to so-called endogenous factors rather than societal racism. In other words, certain causes and explanations are forbidden to be discussed at all. Stadden gives the example of racial wealth disparities, which exist. According to the rules of Darity's new science, the role of so-called endogenous factors like crime, family structure, reproductive choices, academic achievements, skills, spending habits, saving habits, they can't be discussed. They have to be bypassed. They can't be controlled for. They can't be identified. We know the answer. Racial wealth disparities are due to racism. Now, a moment's reflection should reveal that this so-called science ruling out alternative explanations and hypothesis is incompatible with the definition of science, including social science. It cannot claim the mantle of science. It cannot call itself science. Rather, it is dogma. It is ideology. It is just another version of the dogma that Ibram Kendi calls anti-racism, which is committed to the position that, to use his words, there is nothing wrong with Black people. They cannot be criticized. They bear no responsibility. And of course, theirs is nothing to improve or fix. To suggest otherwise is racist and is disallowed. Now, it is notable that Darity's economics colleagues refuse to officially recognize this new separate stratification economics field. And I suppose we should take comfort in that. But anybody familiar with how social science has developed since 2006 and how it is currently practiced knows that although not formally approved, Darity's program has effectively been adopted by many social scientists in the university. Identifying behavioral sources for racial disadvantages or disparities is very much frowned upon. It is called blaming the victim. Pointing to racism and outside forces is, frankly, the formula for getting ahead in today's academic world. It is the approved conclusion. Such is the influence of wokeness on social science. And indeed, it has gone beyond social science. So the medical sciences have become infused with this set of presuppositions and restrictions. Examining and pointing to choices, conduct, and behavior in explaining different racial outcomes in health is no longer accepted. We now have a whole industry of well-funded so-called disparities research in medicine. But all this disparities research comes up with the same conclusion. Racism, racism in the healthcare system, in society as a whole, that is the whole explanation for everything. My view is why bother doing the research if you know the answer, but never mind. Um, now, if you doubt this trend, I invite you to take a look at the New England Journal of Medicine, which is now completely captured by this anti-racist social justice ideology. Some of the doctors I know say it makes good Burge cage lining now. Even more alarmingly, the work turn in social science and biological science has spilled over into the general discourse as reflected by stories in the media. In story after story, the media has adopted the racism explanation as the only acceptable one and avoids like the plague any politically correct conclusions. 
Briefly, here are two examples I have encountered recently. I know I don't want to use too much time because I do want to hear some questions here. Recently, several stories have appeared in our local newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, bemoaning the small number of Black and to some extent Hispanic union members in the local building trades. And of course, these stories stress the long history of discrimination in the building trades, and there has been such a history. But they conclude that today, racism persists. Managerial racism, racism in hiring, that is the problem. That is why we have these disparities. But actually, when I talk to people and pe when people I know, and I have many family members in the healthcare professions talk to people in Philadelphia, sometimes their patients who work in construction fields about their hiring practices, the explanation that comes up over and over for the small number of minorities and actually the difficulties of finding good workers generally is that candidates cannot pass random drug tests. Now, federal law mandates random drug tests for many people in the construction trades or in trades like scrap metal um, workers and the like because they use heavy machinery and a lot of it is dangerous. To put it bluntly, too many black workers are high. Now, you'll say this is anecdata, but it's anecdata worth thinking about and considering. And you would think that a really objective journalist would uncover some of this stuff and want to investigate. But there is no mention of this factor in these stories. And we can guess why not. It's politically incorrect. But of course, by leaving out this possibility, we are seriously misleading the public. We are peddling misinformation and we are distorting policy choices. Another brief example, this past week, maybe it was two weeks ago, there was a full page story in the New York Times, what we call in my house, Pravda, right? <laughs> documenting that Blacks in all social classes suffer a higher incidence of maternal and infant, uh, infant complications in pregnancy. There was a new big study that showed that. It was sort of hard to discern what the research actually showed from the newspaper article, but one thing they were certain of, racism was the cause in the medical system, in society as a whole. Nothing at all in this story about other possible factors about obesity, which has higher incidence in Blacks and is a risk factor, prenatal care and compliance, dietary choices, drug use, family structure. And there are studies showing that married mothers and children fare better and that Blacks of all classes have relatively low marriage rates. So you would think that that factor would come up, but it doesn't. So anyone familiar with this area should be very suspicious of this article, and I certainly was. Once again, birdcage lining. So what is to be done about these trends that I am describing? Well, personally, since I do operate within academia, I would like to see people with academia resist these developments, to speak up, to call them out. But of course, the answer I get when I suggest this is, how many people within the universities really think these trends are bad? Academia today is full of woke true believers, social justice warriors, diversity bureaucrats galore. But I do believe that there are plenty of people in the universities who are not on board with these trends. And it is disappointing that they are not fighting wokeism harder. Now, I know full well that resistance is dangerous and difficult for students or young scholars. They are vulnerable personally and financially. I don't blame them for keeping their heads down, but I will tell you one group that I do blame. People like me, people who are in a better position to stand up and be counted, senior academics with tenure. 
Sure, there's some lefty holdovers in that group who don't mind wokeness, but there are a good number of classical liberals. And they tell me in private how much they hate the new dogma and why woke ideology is stupid and is making us stupid. But they refuse to come out publicly against it. Now, what is this? Is it cowardice? Is it selfishness? Well, I think it's both. Academics, let's face it, have cushy jobs. They have their tasteful homes in Tony neighborhoods, their do-gooder spouses, their normie children, their left-leaning, politically correct friends and colleagues, and they don't want to rock the boat. I get it, but I don't admire it. And of course, a lot of the silence comes from fear. They are afraid of being called the names that I have being call been called, including, of course, being called a racist. But really and truly, when will things ever get better if we don't stand up and dare to say the things that get us called racist? Do we dare to put forward a counter narrative that maybe some of the things that are holding minorities back really are not societal racism, but rather crime, family breakdown, educational underachievement? We need to put forward a counter narrative and put it forward with confidence because without it, wokeness will never be vanquished. The woke ideology will dominate and minorities of all kinds will continue to blame society. They will blame society for the source of their troubles. And I would hope that people in the human sciences and the social sciences would be the first to speak up. Now, in conclusion, I want to say something more about the selfishness factor. As a conservative and someone who teaches a course on conservative thought, I am very aware of the duties and the ties that bind the generation. And of course, I was brought up uh, Jewish in a very devout family with its emphasis on the bris. And the bris is the sacred covenant between those who came before and those who will come after, right? But actually that covenant lies at the heart of the conservative point of view. In the seminar I teach, we start with the work of Edmund Burke. And here's what Edwin Burke says about the generational covenant, which is central to his thinking. He says, quote, among the leading principles on which our commonwealth and laws must be based is our perpetual mindfulness of what we have received from our ancestors and what is due to our posterity. Without that link of duty, between the generations, he says, quote, men would be little better than the flies of summer. My students love that. They're always talking to me about the flies of summer. So Burke understood that the gratitude we owed of the past for the gifts we have received, for the wonderful institutions that have been built and that we have inherited, obligates us to future generations to preserve, protect, and defend those gifts as they are worthy and they are. And yet too often I find that our professoriate and our university officials who should care about the future don't. They certainly don't care if it requires any sacrifice or risk taking. And my forlorn hope is that more people We'll go up against the woke forces laying waste to our universities for young people's sake, for the next generation. Because today, many of those young people feel unsupported, alone, and abandoned. And I know that because I hear from them on a regular basis. I have students sending me emails about how they have to hide their beliefs, how they are afraid of their fellow students how they can't get close to anyone because they're afraid of being exposed as insufficiently woke. So we have fear, caution, lack of candor, intellectual isolation, personal loneliness even, and that is what I am hearing. And we call that an education, 
But of course, it is not an education. So what is to be done? The path forward is not easy. I want to leave you with a final thought, which is at the end of the day, we need to get our politicians interested in this problem because it is a national emergency. We have to prioritize taking action against what is happening, not just at the higher ed level, but in K through 12 schooling, which is in an especially dire state because the students are very vulnerable. They don't have the personal intellectual resources to stand up to indoctrination. So I would urge all of you to take this national emergency seriously and try to get your legislators, the people who represent you, interested in this problem and motivated to take action. Thank you.